Good evening and welcome to tonight's Monday night panel. I hope everybody's well. We have, um, as usual, Vic Morgan doing the hosting tonight with our regular panellists, Anna and Rob. And we've got a special guest, Ivo Graham. So I will bring Vic on. Good evening, Vic. Good evening to you, Chris. I hope you are well. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm all right, thank you very much indeed. Um, How's sunny Devon? Uh, well, it's dark at the minute, but it has been sunny, thank goodness. We have had yes. some sunshine, which has been nice. It's, yeah, it makes it's a been dry, which is good. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's bring everybody on. So let's bring Anna. And we bring Rob. Okay, we seem to have lost Ivo at the moment. Um, so when he comes back on, I'll uh, I'll add into the stream. Okay, marvellous. Right. Uh, right. Well, we've got if plenty to talk about. Questions? If anybody's got any questions, please leave them in the comments, and we'll get through as many as we can. Okay. Enjoy. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Yeah, Ivo Graham will be joining us at some point. <laughs> by the modern uh, technical uh, marvels that we have at the moment. Anna, very good evening to you. Hi, Vic. Uh, Rob, very good evening to you. Evening, Vic. Um, we will be talking about 1969, of course. Uh, today is the anniversary of, uh, you might have seen the scoreline before, uh, Swindon Town 3, Arsenal 1. If you haven't seen it, I don't know where you might have been. Uh, but a, a wonderful day. Um, Anna, I'm assuming you weren't there, is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, a bit, bit, little bit before my time, but obviously, um, you know, great, great memories even of uh, the footage and the uh, and the event, and still brings a bit of a lump to the throat, I think. Mm. And Rob, you were born just slightly after, is that right? Yeah, born in 1969, so I suppose it was my destiny really to put this shirt on, wasn't it? But um, yeah, it was such a fantastic day for everybody in the town. I've heard so many stories about, especially from my mum and dad. So. Um, yeah, it was a fabulous day out, I'm sure, for everyone that was there. So what you're saying then, I'm the only one old enough to have been there in 1969. That's exactly what you're saying, really, isn't it? Uh, which is a uh, good and a bad thing, in a way, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be hearing some reminiscences of 1969 uh, very shortly. But first of all, I think we should talk about, uh, in brief, the events uh, first of the, this last weekend. And we'll talk about it in more meat me and detail a little bit later on when Ivo joins us. But Anna... Your thoughts on Saturday when it looked like we were going to get a managerial change, but who knows whether we'll get a managerial change? Yeah, I mean, it, it's all completely bizarre, isn't it? If you if you stand up in a in a post match press conference and and say you're considering your position, then you know realistically you expect somebody to leave fairly swiftly after that. I would have thought, um, but obviously we've been. I think everyone's been monitoring me, the media uh, through. Through the period since then, and not heard anything different. Um, but he, he's he's pretty much put himself in a kind of an untenable position, really, in, in many respects. And I'm not just talking about the football uh, that we see on the pitch, but but as I said, to to say you're considering your position must really mean that he understands that he's taken us as far as he realistically can, and that's obviously not very far. Yeah, Rob, you of course were there. Um, in your duties as co-commentator with the BBC, um, what were your thoughts? I, I, I'm guessing you're pretty similar to what Anna was just saying. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Anna's covered an awful lot of what I would have said, to be honest. I think the the, the bottom line on Saturday was um, it took everybody by surprise, I think, is the is the bottom line. Because we we really had no link into the fact that John Sheridan was even considering stepping away from the role. Um, so when he effectively headed Andrew off at the pass with his initial response to the first question that came out in the post-match press conference, it did take everybody by surprise. And to be honest, he looked a broken man. There's no two ways around it. He did look a broken man. And you thought, we, he, he really has got no, um, no way back from here. And I don't honestly think he has. I think he's, he's effectively burnt his bridges with that post-match press conference. And I'm not sure he's going to keep the not only the respect of the players, but the respect of the fan base as well. I think um, it's going to be an awfully difficult job for anyone in that situation to ever repair the damage that he's caused by that those uh, those comments after the match. Ivo, very good evening to you. 
Vic, I do apologise. Apologies to all, uh, both working on and watching this stream. Um, I've been beset by uh, issues with my internet um, and broader personal life. Um, so I've joined at the timely hour of 7.04. Um, I've just caught the back end of a conversation about someone who's uh, lost the trust of the fans. I don't, who are we talking about? Um, I don't know what, uh, how much of Saturday. Did you watch the game on Saturday? I did. I didn't even watch it on Saturday. And apologies if that makes me the most terrible plastic. But Tuesday was just too, um, <laughs> it was too bleak. And um, it's been tricky this this season because, you know, apart from the, the obviously the quality of the football, um, being able to watch Swindon on, on the internet, admittedly with, you know, a, a single camera and not a lot of bells and whistles, is is great. Um, but uh, it's I've also got an increasingly boisterous two-year-old so I do need to clear like that Saturday slot. One PM actually better than three. First half in the lunch nap. Um, but in recent weeks, I've started to think I'd rather just sort of, I'd rather just play with my daughter, and then get the bad <laughs> news in just one quick hit at quarter to five or, or quarter to quarter to three in this case, rather than just the slow burn. And the Oxford match was was so poor. Anyway, sorry to um, uh, launch in and immediately monopolise the chat. No, I was just going to say that the conversation regarded, of course, John Sheridan, who um, gave this... Oh, I was, I was aware who we were talking about. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you were doing a bit of a comedic about. thing there. I got that, I got that. Uh, what is your view on that then? Uh, I mean, we're all thinking, you know, we've all been checking. I mean, my Sunday's been looking at Twitter, basically, and Monday, as well as looking at a rerun of the League Cup final of 69, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, cool. So my whole day has been looking at social media awaiting some sort of announcement what's your view been well we've got the announcement that we craved and we think that the rearranged fixture that's uh <laughs> that's, that's what the whole day was building up to wasn't it <laughs> that we were going to finally get some clarity on when we're playing rochdale, Ro away. rochdale yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah the problem is it's too late now I don't mean as in it's too late on Monday to get the news. I don't know whether I believed it. I didn't whether I believed it would happen. But I think I, I think it's too late for the season now. You know, of course, there's still the, um, you know, reset the mood, get the players smiling again, maybe try some, you know, try some Academy products if we've got any. Um, you know, sort of treat this as an extended pre-season for League Two. But turning it around, you know, a lot of those winnable games are gone now. Um, uh, but, yeah, listen, I'm, I'm quite keen to be led by you guys on this because I feel it's such a depressing issue. It's so complex as well. You know, I've, I've, you've got to look for the humanity a little. He's, he's obviously had the most uh, rotten few months on, on the personal front, John Sheridan. But it's hard when you're watching on iFollow with no crowd noise and you can literally hear him abusing the players. It doesn't... That's what's really getting me is, you know, for, for the toxicity to be so audible <laughs> uh, when, when you tune in. It's just... I don't... I, yeah... Well, another of our panel members who comes on regularly, Mark Merriman, who I think you might know Anna quite well. Uh, the players don't believe in Sheridan, and even Sheridan doesn't believe in Sheridan. Um, and Derek has messaged to say regarding the 1969 League Cup final, and me being the only one old enough to have been there. Uh, don't panic, uh, Vic says. Derek, I was there well as well among the Arsenal supporters. Well, well done, Derek, for that. Uh, what about that? <laughs> what about that then, Rob? Uh, the toxicity that, that Ivo mentioned. Good word, by the way. I like it. Um, what about that? Because I think the thing is, I, I think we accept in football that language can be a bit colourful from time to time. If there's a crowd in, of course, we don't hear it. It's that simple. But you will be there. You're doing the co-commentary. You hear the noise. I mean, is it worse than you expected? Is it the same as you expected? How would you sum it up? Um, if I think back to that famous night at Portsmouth, which will go down in history, I think, for the number of expletives used in one game, um, it was incredible. Is the I mean, it, you you can think of all the words in the world to try and uh, to try and describe it, but again, it was one of those events that you th is he really saying that? Did I really hear that properly? Is he really not encouraging the team? 
And it was all those sort of feelings coming through at the same time, yet we were trying to articulate what was going on on the pitch. Yet all that was really coming through was what was coming out from John yeah, Sheridan. Yeah. It was a very bizarre scenario. Can I just say yeah. what a great job you guys do of try, trying to sort of paper over that? So, you know, it's it's been lovely to get a get proper Swindon commentary, even while watching and hearing awfulness. It would be lovely yes. if we had something nice to to, um, to commentate on, Evo, but it's taken a little while, I have to say. There are very few of those matches. I know, and the Ipswich one was on Sky. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would say with the Portsmouth game, of course, those of us who live in far-flung areas, we didn't get your commentary, Rob, so we had to listen to the Radio Solent version of it, and we were uh, Mark Cohn's um, walking in Memphis, broken in the middle of the commentary, which is actually a merciful relief. I thought I was going to uh, say uh, ninety minutes of that would have been perfect. I it would have been great. It. The extended <laughs> version, yes. Uh, Anna, what's your view of that? The language, of course, we don't always hear it, do we? Because, of course, the crowd's in, but we are hearing it this season. Yeah, and I, I suppose you you look at it from the perspective of you want you want a manager who's going to encourage the players. You want a manager who is tactically uh, going to adapt to the, to the situation. And Sheridan doesn't do any of the things we want the manager to do, does he, realistically? So the expletive-laden commentary that he provides on the, alongside the pitch is just one of the elements that really turn fans against him. Um, and you, you've got to say that whatever the players come out with in their post-match interviews, um, they're obviously not going to really talk about what is going on behind the scenes and you have to feel for those players as well. So, you know, Brett Pittman was a bit blindsided, wasn't he, uh, on Saturday with Andrew Hawes uh, pointing out that that um, John Sheridan had just perhaps suggested he might resign. And he seemed more shocked than I expected him to be. You know, I would have expected him to be a bit more, I suppose, oh, well, you know, more coy about his feelings about it. He seemed to genuinely say, I, you know, I've enjoy, I enjoy working with John Sheridan. You know, that's all news to me. Um, but, but, but for us as the fans, you don't want to hear that stuff. You want to hear positivity. You want to hear encouragement. The toxicity that, that uh, Ira referred to is, is just, it seems to permeate throughout the whole, the whole club, really, doesn't it, at the moment? It's, it's not just John Sheridan. I think mm. the, the whole kind of... Um, from, from the back room, from the top down. It's, it's all very toxic. Um, yeah, we've got the ownership to discuss a little later. So we'll get to the ownership matters. Yeah. The, the, yeah, that's something else which is bubbling under. We'll, just, we'll get to that a little later. Uh, this is from Pete. How could the well, season gonna... get any... Sorry, go on, Anna. Yeah, go on. Yeah, sorry. No, I was, I was just going to add that um, last last season, I really felt that we that, that Lee Power had struck lucky in terms of the setup and Richie Wellens. Um, and if you roll the dice as much as Lee Power does every season, you're going to get some of these, these um, kind of, you know, club altering events, which are, which I think is what we're seeing with Sheridan. Really, I think it really is club altering because you're, there's not there's no ethos that's being driven down from top to bottom in the club, which is positive. It's, it's all negativity. Well, this from Pete. How could the season get any worse? Answer: Sheridan taunting us with threatening to resign, and then stays on with renewed self confidence. Uh, this from Anthony: Managers and players swear at each other all the time, which is the point we were making. Uh, from Lena: Funny thing is that there were crowds at the county grounds. Sheridan would have gone by now, as the match atmospheres would have been toxic. Um, Dan says, with his comments made after the Gillingham game, as Sheridan now makes his position untenable well at the moment it appears not i mean crowds being in my mind goes back to a mansfield game some years ago when when uh andy king andy king there was a great deal of pro and against andy king in that particular match and it really was a horrible horrible atmosphere and actually stayed after that game and fortunes did turn round so I don't know, Ivo, is that a possibility? I mean, you've already said, and, and I think many of us have sort of half accepted that uh, League Two is destination next season. Could it turn round? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't think, it, I think... I think it is interesting, this, um, you know, if there were fans in the ground parallel universe. I, I fear, while obviously, you know, it'd be great to be able to go to football games and indeed participate in all other aspects of society and not be in a pandemic, I don't know if it would have changed this season I think Sw Swindon fans I count myself as one and indeed all football fans are uh you know 
can can can, can be um, quick to anger, and um, I've been, you know, in some pretty toxic uh, sort of atmospheres, even quite in, in, in sort of during quite positive periods at the club. And I'm certainly not to, in response to that other comment um, about the swearing. You know, I, I'm, I'm not coming on because I, I can't handle a bit of effing and blinding on I follow, and I just like to see some sort of parental advisory warning. Um, I suppose it's because it's not. Um, and that's just it, from Rob, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's 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 all of that combined with the lack of any other, um, you know, finesse or plan. You know, it it just it just it is the most lumpen. Um, sort of manifestation of this, you know, dinosaur approach, and it's which is such a come down after, you know, quite a forward thinking, dynamic, tactical manager that we had with someone who who has, you know, just been around and was a, you know, serious Premier League pro. You know, he's been in the game forever, but hasn't, you know, hasn't done much as a manager certainly in recent years. I, you know, Di Canio was horrible. You know, Di Canio, uh, you know, swore at people, fell out with people. Also, kind of, you know, there were players that he kind of ruined as well. You know, like people like Luke Rooney. I remember how excited I was when Luke Rooney signed. And, you know, Di Canio, I'm sure if, if you didn't, you know, would, would ruin play some players' confidence. But there was enough, clearly there was enough money to just keep bringing players in. But also the methods worked on enough players that it was hewn into something very very exciting and dynamic um so i'm not you know it's not just that i think that managers should be polite i mean i am a tediously polite uh person you know i'm i'm a luke williams i you know i'm i'm a sort of you know shaking hands and going down quietly we go again saturday you know that's that's and i'm aware that doesn't work either we got relegated <laughs> with that as well yeah yeah but it's it's just it's just that every aspect is so depressing and players come in and god knows how many players we've have come in you know, Dominic Thompson, was so good against Ipswich. And maybe that was just, you know, him having an unusually good game. But it's how quickly players just seem to be ruined um, yeah, under we, this regime. Rob, we've spoken many times about Dominic Thompson, haven't we? Uh, you know, to, when he came in, he, he's got this amazing ability to cross a football. And now nobody crosses a football, it seems to me. It just seems to have disappeared. Um, this is from Wayne. Why say he resigned and then nothing? Do we think Power has talked him out of it? I really don't think Power wants him to go as we can't afford anyone else as he's cheap. What do the panel think? Well, Rob, what, what about that? I mean, I don't think Lee Power was there on Saturday, was he uh, or not? No, he wasn't there Saturday. He was there Tuesday, but there was no sign of him Saturday. I mean, going back to the Dominic Thompson points, I don't think any Sw any Swindon player now can cross their legs, let alone cross a ball. <laughs> it certainly feels that way at the moment. But it's um, the, the Sheridan um, situation is just. It, I, I sat I sat there on Saturday, and if you 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 know the way these things work, Andrew goes down to the touchline, interviews John Sheridan. Most of the press are there, and I'm sat there on the in the commentary box on my own. And I'm listening through the headphones what uh, is coming. And there is a tirade of uh, negativity towards John Sheridan coming through the studio, as you would imagine. And there he is on this side of the pitch, turning around and saying, I picked the wrong team. I should have played Jack Payne. I've, apo uh, I've apologised to him because I did he should have played. I used five substitutions. Five substitutions? What on earth was going on there? When it really, it was like, I, I've seen it on social media. You put the Benny Hill music on it and it yeah. did feel exactly like that. It was yeah. that kind of a moment. Yeah. And uh, I suppose we, at least one thing this season, we have created history, which won't be repeated anywhere else. But um, <laughs> uh, I, you, 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 you think that we've sunk to the, the, deep, the deepest depths game by game and they find a way every week to just plummet that bit further. And that's what it feels like at the moment. Well, uh, seven goalkeepers and five substitutes. That's not bad, is it? Uh, Luke Hodgson says, uh, was uh, Tisdale there, Rob? Saw that rumour on Twitter. Well, I think you can confirm he wasn't there. He's been linked with Lake Norian. Uh, that's the latest that I've seen from my Exeter connections. Um, lots of other comments coming in. So thank you very much indeed for this. Um, we're going to talk briefly about now 1969 because um, we've established that I am the only person who's old enough to have been there in those days. But Anna, the 69 er fanzine, which you co-founded, of course, was named after that very day, was it not? 
Yeah, of course. And what what else could you call a what else could you call a swimming town fanzine if not after our greatest ever success? Um, yeah, so you know we we've had a lot of other we've had a lot of other good times watching the town though, haven't we? Aside from that, um, but if you think back to that achievement, it kind of mirrors as well, you know, with that with that pitch that they played on at Wembley. Some of the pictures you're seeing currently, not not perhaps so much the county ground, but I know Newport has really suffered badly through. Uh, you know, through through this season, but um, as a, as a town, it's it's still obviously fondly remembered. We still got Don Rogers and his sports shop going down at down at the bottom of the town. Um, but yeah, like you said, I'm I'm a bit too young to uh, to have recalled it in uh, in great detail. Well, I was there. I'm proud to say, and I watched it again this afternoon as I do on every March the fifteenth at oh. around about three thirty, and it's available on YouTube. Uh, one of the one versions I watched. The match was played at double speed, but the commentary wasn't. So the commentary got further and further and further back. <laughs> <laughs> but but you certainly got Great. through the first half very quickly, which was uh, very funny indeed. Uh, so then, uh, let's find out about 1969, March the 15th, uh, 52 years ago. My goodness me. Uh, when my hair was almost uh, as uh, it's almost as long as it was then uh, now. Uh, but let's hear from one of the players involved in that 1969 League Cup final and get reminiscences from John Trollope, who joined us on the sofa uh, last year. The goal, the opening goal in one of the biggest dog's breakfasts of defensive mix-up in the history of football. There's no question about that. Yeah. Yeah. What were your thoughts when Roger... I mean, we'd seen a magnificent goalkeeping display from Peter Downs, but I just remember him flinging himself all over the penalty area, making save after save. I think, I, I think the first 20 minutes, if it hadn't have been for Peter, we, we wouldn't have been in the game. Um, certainly, uh, I didn't see John Radford for about 25 minutes. Uh, you know... He, just played for England and the big strong lad and the pitch didn't matter to him because he he was a strong and fat and I can't, I can't say I see him much in the first 20 minutes I felt but Peter and Stan and uh, um, Frank they were superb and kept us in the game and obviously then we managed to get in front. Yeah what about that goal what were your feelings when it went on in were you thinking great we've got a goal or it's only 35 minutes gone. We've got a long way to go. Oh, no, that, you, I, th I never thought when you score in the first half, you, you won the game and, you know, anything can happen, can it? Uh, I think it's been proved many times since that, uh, you know, you can never, never say you've won a game, I don't think, unless you're about five up with added time to go. <laughs> the it, the sickener, of course, was Bobby Gould, who uh, many Swindon fans will remember for that smile after it equalised. Uh, Brian Moore said uh, it was a great smile. Swindon fans, less so. Yeah. Um, and he'd actually been involved in an incident which, he, I mean, today could have been off the pitch, couldn't he? Oh, yeah. yeah. But we got away with quite a lot now. I mean, some of the bookings and red cards now, I mean, they're winning the ball and they're getting booked, you know, and... But in those days, you could bump. And I mean, Harry Cousins always said to me, he said, if you got a winger, he said, first five minutes, give him a bump. He said, and then he knows you're about. Uh, and that's that, that is how we looked at it. And um, I think the good thing about it is that, that players never overreacted to being bumped. You know, they picked themselves up and next time they done you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, everything's changed in, in football. It's, it, it's quite a different game than what we played. It was a sickener, though, wasn't it? Just moments to go, really. And uh, Bobby Gould, it's a bit like the World Cup final, isn't it? When Weber got the goal to yeah. take it into extra time, it was a similar sort of feeling, I'm guessing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, I would think it was a long ball forward. It flicked and then it fouled, didn't it? Straight to him. So, you know, that happens. That, you know, but uh, as I said, I think we weren't too... We were, were worried because usually the team who gets a late goal as the impetus to go and, and win it. But we extra time to us uh, with the fitness we had, I don't think caused, you know, no problem at all. So into extra time then. And uh, Don gets the one just before half time. And, and it wasn't a classic Don Rogers goal, although the control in the penalty area was magnificent, wasn't it? Uh, no, he, uh, he, he changed, I think he changed feet, didn't he, or something to put it in. And he, he was, I mean, it, it, he could score goals, different types of goals, Don. Um, 
and uh, you know to get back up again two one up so that we were on our way yeah fantastic and and then that goal which clinches it i mean my word it is one of wembley's greatest goals isn't it well it's, it's, uh, you know it, it, he's picked the ball up in his own half and just gone and gone and gone and gone and sort of went round bob wilson in the end and slotted it in i mean and there was no comeback from that because it was about the last minute or so wasn't it yeah it was yeah magnificent and i can tell you i can still see it now uh you know, as he rounds him and just slots it into the yeah. corner of the net. Magnificent. But it was uh, the control he had when he was going, because, as you say, it wasn't the best of pitches. Uh, but he just seemed to be able to control it, even on those types of pitches. So, you know, he's the best best player I've ever played with on the ball. I mean, he, and not only could he create goals, he was a good goal scorer. What about the feeling then when that one went in? Was that relief? Oh, that was it. Yeah, yeah. You knew, you know, everybody knew that was it. You know, so to do that, being in the the old third division, League One, as it is now, you know, so uh, you know, it's uh, one one thing they can never take away from me. There you are. There you are. The great John Trollope talking about uh, the March the. 15th, 1969, and that wonderful 3-1 success against Arsenal Football Club at Wembley. I did watch it again this afternoon. I do watch it religiously every the 15th of March. That pitch is horrendous. But I, every year, you, it's like it's like listening to a, a great LP. You always find more and more every time you listen to it. And every time you watch that game, you see more and more. Like Don Heath had a fabulous game, which you didn't think about before. You know, and, and you pick out moments like that. So it's our history, it's our greatest day. Uh, that team behind me on that shirt will be forever oh, uh, legend of the football club. So there you are. Ivo, I guess, you know, you've grown up. You must have seen it. You must have watched it. I have watched it in full. I, maybe I should come around with you one of these one of these anniversary years. Yeah, yeah, come down. Yeah, we'll have a few I mean, I, I've, 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 I've got very little to add, to be honest. I, 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 you know, I, um, it's, it's obviously a wonderful historic day. Sing about it at the county ground, but... I'm not going to compete with someone who was there on the day and has watched it every year since. This is your story, Vic. Where where did you uh, what what did you do afterwards? Uh, we got back on the bus and went back to Malmesbury because I was at school in those days. And uh, of course, the M4 wasn't even built properly, so it took a long time to get out. And as you'll know, having been to Wembley, the worst thing about Wembley is getting out that bleep bleep car park, isn't it? it takes forever. <laughs> I love that and, that's stuck in the memory. Yeah, it has indeed. So there we are, 1969. Don Rogers getting the second one. There it is. There's the program. Uh, there's the autobiography of Don and Danny Williams's scrapbook, which I'm sure is still available from the club should you wish to purchase it. Right, let's come back sadly to now. Um, gosh, lots of comments come in. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Oh, this is from Steve. Hello, Steve. I was there, Vic. I even walked under a ladder, but I'm on the way to the ground with work. My dad, uh, granddad, and brother changed my life. Mentioned it in assembly at school today. How brilliant is that? Very good. Well done, Steve. Uh, this remark the power of fans' protest should never be underestimated. Taking off Swindon players in the manner in which Sheridan has in the last two home games, it's been unprecedented and would have led to unsavoury scenes in the ground. Uh, Paul says he was never going. It was just a ploy to avoid the questions after a humiliating defeat. Um, Joe, uh, by not resigning or being sacked today, both Sheridan and Power are showing nothing but contempt for the supporters. And Anthony says, um, Ivo's PDC summary is a great example. Nobody cares when you're winning. And that actually, Rob, is very true. I mean, what if these... Methods had worked and he'd won, I don't know, uh, 10 out of the last 12. Would we be sitting here discussing this now? Well, I think we'd be having a conversation, but it'll be a different sort of conversation, wouldn't it? Let's be honest. I mean, I, I was thinking the same thing when we talked about the swearing earlier on. If Town had been on a run of 10 wins out of 12 and you heard John Sheridan sit, um, swearing in the way that he was, would we be having the same conversation? So, um, it should be the same conversation in all cases. But we know the reality of the situation is it's every it's that we are the greatest team in the world when we win. We are the worst team in the world when we lose. It's the life of a football supporter. We're well used to it. Um, I think the problem here, is, more than anything else, is we get nothing back from John Sheridan to try and be positive. 
There is nothing to feed off from what he says. We're getting very little positivity from behind the scenes as well. So we're having to do it all ourselves. And in a world where COVID has taken away the life of a football fan almost completely because you're stuck behind a screen watching when everybody wants to be in that ground doing whatever they usually do from day to day, um, it's a soul-destroying experience. And I think we've said before on these calls, I mean, whilst I'm the, I, I feel sometimes I'm the luckiest person in the world to be in that ground. I also feel like I'm the unluckiest person as well when I have to deal with some of the stuff that goes on with it. So it's a, it's a very, very bizarre set of circumstances this year. But more than anything else, it is we need some positivity. Everyone with a Swindon fan, every Swindon fan needs something to feed off. And we're getting nothing back at the moment. Anna, have you got anything to be positive about? Uh, in the short <laughs> answer, no. But, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty positive person, but but Rob's absolutely right. There's 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 just this has been a season, uh, and as it's drawing to its close, it's it's almost entirely without hope, to be honest. Um, you know, you need a recovery and a run of Burton-esque proportions, which clearly we're not going to get under Sheridan. Uh, it's, it's four wins out of 22. Is that right since you took charge? I, I did have a quick look before you came on. I think that's about right. So, you know, there's there's nothing to show that he's going to turn it around. Um, and as the games creep on, it just becomes more and more desperate. And for us sitting at home watching it on iPhone, you know, the, the only the only positive experience I have, to be honest, is when I get to get to shout a bit of abuse at the, um, the, way, uh, the home commentators when we're playing away. Because obviously I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take it out on Andrew Horns, but <laughs> give it a bit large when, when we're playing away from home. But there's just there's absolutely nothing to be positive about. As Rob said, we get nothing back from the club. The in, the post match interviews, quite frankly, from Tommy Wright and uh, and John Sheridan are just absolutely laughable. They tell us nothing. They give us no hope. Uh, and I just wonder after the after the game on Saturday whether it wasn't kind of more of a a knee jerk from Sheridan. He, ha he obviously hadn't thought through what he was going to say. It came completely out of the blue and wasn't hasn't been backed up with any substance. Uh, Hans from Norway. Hello to you, Hans. Uh, Sheridan has been rude and inept in man management all his managerial career. The Google search only confirms that he's been like this in every club. Horrible, unbelievable appointment in the first place. Obviously, we don't know what goes on in the dressing room, so that's one thing we can't comment on. Um, Stephen says, what confidence do the panel have an adequate replacement would be found by Lee Power if Sheridan did resign? Ivo, do you think... I mean, I... You know, if you were to ask me now, do I think a change is going to happen before Saturday? I think, it's, to be honest, I think it's unlikely. But, you know, who knows in football? But if it did, are we going to get an adequate replacement who's going to come in, see the mess it's in at the minute, sort it out and be ready for next season? I mean, who would you even think about would want to do that? I, I don't. I No, I don't. I don't know the answer. I... um. I don't think there is going to be someone else. I think Anna has got it absolutely right. It's you look at the, the that interview on Saturday, and it, it's it's just it's just faff, isn't it? It's um, uh, it's sort of misdirection. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I don't I don't know enough about the landscape of good available young you know lower league managers. The fact is, there are a few good ones floating around in October. And uh, they went to teams who are now doing quite a lot better than us. You look at Burton, mm. so depressing. Burton, you know, or even, I don't want to end up saying that I would, uh, you know, Bristol Bristol Rovers makes me a bit, bit slightly more sort of, you know, um, uh, confused, obviously. Um, but they're probably going to, I don't know. Who, who, who do you reckon, Vic? Oh, it's a good question. That's why I'm asking it. I mean, at the minute, I mean, um, we all have our views on who might do a good job. I mean, I know who would be a cracking manager who's manager at St. James Park just down the road from me, but I, I, I dare say he's not going to leave Exeter anytime soon. Um, it, I, I think the thing is, Rob, whoever takes this on, it's a massive job. Anthony's just pointed out, and we've talked about this, 15 losses at home in all competitions this season already. Truly, I mean, 15 losses at home. I mean, who? Where does that come from? It's a, a, well, we, we, we've used the word unprecedented on so many occasions over the course of the last year. Fifteen losses at home is just unbelievably poor. It truly is. It's manifested itself. To be honest, last season, if you think back over the course of the last five or six seasons, 
last season under Richie Wellens, obviously we know how wonderful the football was last year and how well we played as a team. But that was a little bit atypical because season after season prior to that, we'd gradually been losing more and more home games. And uh, this season, well, I, I can't believe this season will ever be beaten. Four cup losses at home, 11 league losses at home. There's still four more games to go, so we can add to that tally. Yeah, there's plenty of opportunities. Hard home and games as well. <laughs> it really is bizarre. But mm. we will talk about home games because obviously that's the that's the, the meat and drink. That's where we go every week, go and support our side. But we're 24th out of 24 on the road. We've got the worst <laughs> points record um, per team in the division away from home. And 22 defeats overall in the season is the worst in the football league. And I'm 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 doing my very best to come up with some really really positive stats, Vic. But I'm struggling, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I, ask... go on, go on. I'm sorry. Go well, just on. it's in... what you guys think about uh, the players because I'm you know the I, I don't really know who's who's best place to come in. As I said, I'm not really sure I'd want it to be Joey Barton, but I'd take pretty much anyone else. Um, but. This parallel universe thing of, oh, it was already going bad under Richie Wellens and he knew. He knew the last summer wasn't good enough and lots of players had left. And I, I'm where would we be now under Richie Wellens with the squad that was, you know, assembled in September, do you think? I, I, I reckon you've only got to look at the example of Burton. So Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank came into that. They were, they were, they were completely messed up, complete basket case at the bottom of the table. He's won nine out of 11 with, with okay, I think they refreshed a little bit, didn't they, in January? Well, they happened to sign Johnny Smith, Smith which made yeah, Johnny Smith is doing brilliantly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, so I think, I mean, I, I think things did start to go wrong last, last summer. The recruitment wasn't great, but put this club and think it's, it's worth taking on in the current circumstances with you know, very little financially, um, no, no structure around anything, no communication, no transparency of finance. I honestly can't think of many managers out there who are going to come and think, "Great, yes, yeah, Swindon Town, let's let's go for that." And we can say all we like till we, you know, till we're blue in the face that we're a sleeping giant, which you know we, we kind of are, but not with the the the, the, the ownership we've got at the moment. To be honest, well, the, the thing is, Rob, until we get the ownership sorted out, nobody knows where we're going anyway, do we? I mean, we've seen. Uh, you know, I must be the only person in the world who's not had a phone call from uh, Clem Morfuni. I, 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 I read on social media that everybody's had a phone call from him, but he hasn't rung me, which I'm a bit disgruntled about, to be fair. Uh, but, you know, uh, we're, until that's sorted out, nobody knows in which direction this club's going, do they? No, it's fundamental, Vic. It, it's the it's the be-all and end-all. It's the big question for everybody. Taking it back to the summer when we were all buoyant because of the um, results from last season. What was the first thing that happened? The contract situation came up for everybody. They were all offered contracts, either lower or at best the same as what they had before, but generally a cut. Then you lose all your players. The players that were the, they were the fulcrum for why we achieved what we achieved last year. Richie Wellens organised them. That was the difference. The players were good enough. Those players would have been good enough. You've only got to look now at the way Jerry Yates is scoring goals at Blackpool. Owen Doyle is scoring goals at Bolton, admittedly a league below. We still, they, those goal scorers who were here last year are still popping those goals in wherever they are now. We would be pushing playoffs. That league this year is not a good league. League one is, this. I was expecting a step up in quality. And if I'm truly honest, I haven't seen it. The difference in this division is that they are organised. Teams are a lot more organised than teams in league two. And when you give them a chance, generally speaking, they take it. And let's be honest. We have given teams an awful lot of chances this season, haven't we? We've I mean, made things very, very easy for them. The, the football has been terrible, I have to say. I mean, I, I, you know, I know we're sitting, you, you're seeing it live, we're sitting watching it on the screen where the little white circle keeps going round and, and it, it, it's a, like a mush most of the time. But watching it, it's just dreadful football. Uh, Matt Taylor has uh, messaged in. I don't think it's the one from St. James Park, although he doesn't live far away from me, so he might have messaged him. You never know. If Jurassic John goes, then it should be a short-term internal appointment. Lee Peacock would fit the bill for me. Um, uh, Ross Embleton is free, says Anthony. Because <laughs> just less left late lawyers. Uh, uh, Lee Powers' January transfer window dealings were truly disgraceful. Why are the club communications so poor? Bad customer service really gets uh, repeat custom. 
uh, from Pete. Uh, this for you, Ivo. How proud did you feel when Archie Matthews made his debut? And has he promised your, his shirt to you? And what other goalkeeping talent has Ivo spotted for the town? Explain the Archie Matthews situation, can you? Well, shortly before um, the season uh, was abandoned because of coronavirus, I took on the noble honour of sponsoring Archie Matthews in uh, about February of last year. Um who was Swindon's third choice keeper then. And, you know, this season has been anywhere between, you know, first choice keeper at 259 and keeper who apparently we will literally sign anyone uh, so that he doesn't have to play. You've got to feel quite sorry for the guy. Um, I've been accused of milking my Archie Matthews sponsorship, so I don't want to take up too much of tonight talking about it. Um, I don't even know if I am still technically a sponsor or if someone else has stepped in. It was very pr uh, exciting to see him against Northampton. Um, he was, if you were being really harsh, you'd say he was slightly at fault for the Northampton goal, could have got down more quickly. So I was very relieved as a sponsor or an ex-sponsor that that was one of the very few matches uh, this season we did actually manage to see out. So that he couldn't be blamed, um, but I mean, who'd who'd be a keeper and who would be a Swindon Town keeper this season? Well, anybody, um, it seems to be. Honest. Yeah, yeah, everyone's having a go. I mean, <laughs> but Mark Mark Travers is like a great keeper. It's almost it's almost a dream now that we had Travers for a bit. You know, will probably be a sort of second tier, you know, uh, keeper for, for for years and years. Um, I can't say I'm even able to keep up with. Was it Truman on Saturday? Or was it is Wallacott yeah, gone now? Will we ever see Jojo Wallacott in a Swindon shirt again? No, I think that the only reason Truman played, Rob, I think I'm right in saying, is that they signed him on a seven day emergency deal, and now we've got Lee Camp on a, till the end of the season. Is that right? Right. Yeah, it just gets more and more complicated, doesn't it? Yeah, if you sign someone on a seven-day deal, they have to see out that seven-day deal because you have brought someone in on an emergency loan. So you can't have another goalkeeper come in and replace an emergency loan because otherwise you fall and follow the rules. But Lee Camp obviously is presumably to be the the next Archie Matthews replacement Evo for the rest of the season. And um, of course, he's he's well, he's certainly been around the leagues, hasn't he? But he will become when he plays on Saturday, presuming he does, the fortieth player this season to wear the tan shirt. Forty players in a season. Wow, it's that's amazing. truly incredible. It is. Um, I should say I've got a pair of goalkeeping gloves upstairs for my walking football session. So I, <laughs> there you I go. am available. There you go, I am available. <laughs> um, actually, and I've got. Uh, I should mention one positive. Okay, from Saturday, one positive. Brett Pittman got Swindon's six thousandth league goal on Saturday. The five thousandth, if you're asking, was Sean O'Hanlon. So uh, well done to Brett Pittman. He's in the record books. Uh, it's Bobby a shame Barnes, he couldn't have got it against Oxford from the penalty spot five days beforehand, isn't it? If you mention that word again, Ivo, I will ban you. Is that okay? <laughs> the O word. Uh, I don't yeah, think yeah. I don't think Brett has had a terrible season. He's clearly got an eye for goal, but that was one of the weakest penalties you could hope to see in a crucial derby. Very well, depressing the, stuff. The fact of the matter is, if you look at it, there was a chance that um, Anthony Grant had, wasn't there? The volley, which if he'd had it on target, it was going in. It's as simple as that, really. And then the penalty. I mean, stupid though this sounds, we could have won that game. You, you know, we could have won it. And who knows? And they weren't very good, Vic. They weren't very good, Oxford. No. I think people, no. are, people are, have focused so much on the fact that it was our poor performance. And that's true. But Ox, I mean, Ruffles got absolutely ripped to shreds by Garrick in the first half. But it was there was no final ball, and that seems to be again our problem. We just don't. We get into positions our players who seem to be able to do everything outside the final third, and they're frightened as rabbits when they get inside the final third. Except Brett Pittman in front of goal, generally speaking. But that penalty that that could be season defining, couldn't it? It could easily have been Sheridan defining as well. We score that penalty one one. Twenty minutes left. Town go on and win that, do the double over Oxford, season turns around, everybody's, everybody's happy. In the end, defeat to Oxford, it's misery once more. And um, I'd love to turn around and say, mm -hmm. we're all going to be great. It's all going to be great in the next 11 games. That's my optimistic head. My face probably says something different. <laughs> Anna, you were going to make a point... Go on, sorry, I, I apologize. Oh, I've got my stats wrong. If Brett Pittman had scored the penalty, 
then of course Taylor Curran would have been the six thousandth Swindon <laughs> scorer, which I think would have been That's far true. more appropriate. <laughs> hilarious. Uh, it would have been hilarious. And just imagine the banter from that. That would have been great. <laughs> Anna, you were gonna speak, you were gonna say. Yeah, I was just gonna say I was a, I was a bit surprised that Rob said earlier that he reckons this is a poor division because it uh, to, to my mind, we've been so shockingly bad that every other team seems really good, and I think that just shows how how few how few chances we've created, how how little tactical awareness we appear to have on the pitch, how little shape we've got, uh, the lack of discipline, and that that obviously you know stems stems from stems from the the, the, the backroom staff, I would say. Um, but you can't you can't expect that you can't expect us to turn it around when there's no sign of any of any momentum building. You know we had those three results, and uh, when we played against Sunderland away, I thought actually you know, we actually look like a bit of a team here. Yeah, yeah We're yeah. playing together. It wasn't wasn't fantastic. You know we didn't create shed loads of chances, but I thought we looked like we got it together. And that, if we'd have held on to that uh, for a point, oh, Twine's free kick had gone in at the end. I think there could have been that bit of a bit of momentum building, but since then, I think it's it's just all gone completely out of the window in terms of in terms of any hope and momentum. Um, and I don't I don't think that we haven't got the players. I think Floyd Hasselbank again has showed that at Burton. Um, I just don't think we've got any any structure, discipline, tactics. Uh, and I feel so I, I just feel sorry for the players just being rolled out each week, really. And told it's almost like go and get on with it. There's no service into Pittman. Um, you, you see little flurries of, of activity from Twine and Garrick and, and Joel Grant on Saturdays, but really not much. And we're, we're creating so so few chances that it's not surprising that um, it's taken so long for Pittman to get to. Is that was that his fifth or sixth goal of the season? Which isn't which isn't a great return, is it? Really, I think for for, for your main striker. Um, interesting. I, uh, I I said to you on Saturday, well, didn't I? I thought um, Scott Twine was going to have a Gerald Eiffel moment at Nottingham Forest where he just had had enough and just kicked the player and got sent off. He was in that sort of mood, wasn't he? I, I, I genuinely thought he was going to blow it and just get a red card. No, he was going to be one of the five substitutes just to save him being sent off. Well, it, it was a shocking to have chuckle on him. And to be honest, he has been subject to a bit of roughhouse treatment over the course of the last few weeks because uh, opposition managers know that he is the one creative spark in the team. So if you can get a, you know, if you can stop him playing, you're probably going to stop Swindon playing. Um, so I, I, I felt a little bit for him. You obviously can't ever condone any situations where you go back at players, but he was clearly so visibly frustrated with what else had gone on. He suddenly gets his legs taken away from him as he's breaking forward. And he just reacted to it. And he's a little bit fortunate. Somebody, I can't remember who it was, came in and, and saved him, I think, from possibly what might have been a red card at that time. Um, but you, you could see, and that's that frustration building up in you. And to be honest, we've had that frustration all through the season. Anna mentioned about the, the, the state of the league. If I, My comment about the, the level this season, you've just got to look at the teams we played at the top of the league. Lincoln were dreadful when we, we drew to all there. And they weren't much better at the county ground when they beat us. Sunderland edged that game 1-0 it, it, um, up there and they didn't deserve to score against us. Correct, They created absolutely nothing. Hull, OK, they had a comfortable victory at their place because Swindon didn't turn up on the day, but at our place, we beat them. And Peterborough, although they did beat us in the end for 45 minutes, I've never seen Nathan Thompson get the run around anything any more than I, I saw in that first 45 minutes at Peterborough. The yeah. best sides mm -hmm. in this division We've moaned and groaned quite rightly for 40 odd minutes about how poor Swindon have been. We could so easily have won all of those games. <laughs> Lots of comments. This from Joe. We are lucky to have 31 points. We played well twice under Sheridan, Lincoln, and Ipswich away. We'll finish rock bottom with him in charge. Uh, from Anthony, Kevin Horlock and Ian Culverhouse doing well at non league. And fans' favourites, Steve Curtis says Lee Camp will be the first, the next manager. You heard it first, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then he'll no doubt sign another goalkeeper, which will take us into another league record. Uh, and another positive from Saturday was Anthony Grant getting more game time. He'll play, play most games from now on. Uh, well, you know who who knows who will play from now on. I don't know. I've owned your time as a town fan. And I think you go back to you. You fell in love with the club under Hoddle. Is that right? That that Hoddle issue. No, that's a bit early, sadly. Oh, uh, um, Decanio time. 
was it the Decanio? Uh, no, you... but but uh, no, halfway in between, I'd say ninety nine. When we my first season, we were relegated from uh, what's now the Championship, and I remember my dad saying, "They'll be back." Um, <laughs> and obviously, you know, still TBC. So that would have been ninety nine <laughs> or two thousand. Two thousand, we were relegated. Um, so I have seen. Uh, yeah, so this this if it, if it happens, and obviously you know we've all been very negative, uh, but you know we'd love it not to happen. But if we are relegated, it'll be the fourth relegation to League Two, um, and and the most depressing by I'd mm-hmm. say some way because of how because of everything. I mean, you know, even just the fact that it's taking place in the midst of a global pandemic with just relentless bleak news from elsewhere. The fact that it was fo- following on from such a good season. The fact that it, there's been this toxicity, the fact that there's been so much comedy to it, the fact that you know we're we're a punchline of a of a, of a club for so many ways, um, you know, 2017 we just fizzled. You know, we just weren't very good and had a rather uninspiring manager who was better as an assistant. I remember the one in 2011 that was depressing because that was a that was a good team and that had big big players, maybe two maybe too big. And we lost Charlie Austin in January and you couldn't really believe it until suddenly it was, you know, March and it was Paul Hartman who were going down. But this is just, it's relentless. It's completely relentless. And League Two, you just then think, oh, we just, we just got out of it. And it's such a mucky league and without good management and without good ownership, you don't know whether you're just going to be sitting in the mid table for a couple of years and then going down again. Which is what before Richie Wellens, you just thought there's no upward momentum, and we fluked it. We fluked a good manager who basically put his imprint on the team. You said this, you know, himself because the, you know, chairman hasn't really. And it's just yeah, it's it's gone. So it's it it really is the most depressing one for me. Yeah, it, it is pretty. I mean, we didn't even have a chance to celebrate the championship, did we? That was no. that would I think pretty much. A kick in the teeth too. At least it's Betty's tea room at Harrogate. We can all go there and have a nice cake yeah. next. That will that will help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you put this in a stand? It's too painful to put in a stand-up routine. This Ivo, isn't it? All this, this this football club. I mean, at the minute, it's kind of good material for you, but you wouldn't do it because it's too painful. I've well, I've talked about a lot of painful uh, personal experiences in my stand-up, but um, uh, you know, the the the, the more concerned sort of. But basically, any any attempts I've made to to sort of crowbar Swindon Town into an on-stage routine have, have largely lost the audience fairly quickly. It's um, you're very aware that it's a niche concern. I'd much rather you know do enormous amounts of online Swindon Town content such as this and be amongst friends um, than try to make people understand you know who Lee Power is and how he's <laughs> how he needs to pull his finger out. Um, so no, I I don't. Um, I'll bear it in mind as an option, but uh, if if there's any way of just wiping this whole year from my memory, I'll probably go with that option. We'll come to your Wyvern Theatre show. Is that okay if you put one on there? Uh, Steve Steve says, uh, Anna, can you talk about the Academy, Academy instead? I mean, I don't know. I mean, we've seen Scott Twine come through. We've seen Archie Matthews get a game. You know, there are one or two players, I guess, that we can hope come through. I saw a fabulous goal at the weekend in a, in the under 18s. Um, I can't remember who scored it now, but it was a fantastic. Oh, uh, Malcolm says, Ivo, we need you in the dressing room doing a motivational speech. So there you are, get in there and do that. Very kind, <laughs> um, very so kind. I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's what we'd all love to see, Anna, isn't it? Lots of young local players coming in and playing for the badge, like Scott Twine has done, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely is because when you when you see Twine on the pitch and you, you see Matthews, uh, you know, albeit last gasp, making an appearance, um, it, it kind of it kind of brings you brings a lump to your throat. Really, you think, yeah, we're we're, we're, we're some local some local local talent coming forward, but but to to really develop the academy players. You've got to have some structure in the club, in the club, which means they're going to get an opportunity, and that clearly hasn't been the case really for for, for the last few seasons at least. Uh, and and without that structure in place, whereby they're they're actually kind of scouted for the first team, and I know that should be by as as rote really, because they are you know your, your own academy. I just don't see it. Don't see it happening. It's almost like a bit part player in the background. Um, and, and there potentially just to sell on, you know, you, you, a number of players have departed, haven't they, at the age of 15 or 16 for, 
a much bigger club than us for, for, for fees and for future salon fees. So I just, and, until there's, there's a real ethos about developing that academy talent in order to bring first team into the first team, I don't think it's really realistic. To, it's, it's going to be the odd one every now and again. Yeah, Luke Haynes is being mentioned as another one. And, and it was Harry Parsons who scored that free kick at the weekend against those the players who play in yellow. It was a great goal. I, I, you know, if you have a chance to, to see it on, online, have a look, because it was a fantastic shot. Um, is Clem the answer is a question. Uh, again, uh, he's not rung me, so I've never spoken to the chap. Uh, apparently he went to a lot of away games, Rob. I don't recall seeing him. We don't know what the answer is, do we? You can speak, you can write, you can talk, but until it actually happens, we don't know. Simple as that. Well, we also don't know at the moment who's who legally owns the club either, do we? Which obviously is a, a, a big bone of contention with the court cases that are taking place just at the moment. And I guess until we reach the conclusion of those court cases, could Clem Morphoni take over? Could anyone else take over? Who knows? Um, I think we this is this is the one of the biggest bugbears I think we've had in years at this club because we don't know whether there is someone out there who really would pile money in, would take us forward. We all hope that that dream is still there for somebody who can do that for us, but it ain't happening at the moment with the man in charge. So um, either he stands aside and falls on his sword, and everyone else, um, you know, can can then come up and pick, come in and pick the pieces up. Or we're going to be stuck in this limbo land, and heaven forbid the likes of Harrogate Tea Rooms could become a a, a mo more common retreat for us all over a, a Saturday lunchtime. I'm certainly preferable to Harrogate Tea Rooms at the moment than maybe um, the bacon rolls at Bromley and Boreham Wood, if I'm truly honest. So um, there is a lot of work to be done this summer. There is no doubt at all about that. And off the field is absolutely critical. It's the most critical part of it. OK, we'll get on to the next game in a moment before we wrap up. Malcolm says it needs a top-to-bottom clean-up. Unfortunately, it will not happen under the current chairman. Needs someone who loves the club. Uh, from Pete, these are dark days for STFC. We have an owner who wants to sell but can't. You also don't want, he doesn't want to invest. Our only hope for a manager is someone who loves STFC. Step up Lee Peacock. We'll see. Uh, right. On Saturday, Ivo, we go to Fleetwood, who uh, play... Uh, that uh, wonderful piece of music from, um, oh gosh. Uh, Captain Pugwash. Captain Pugwash, of course it is. We heard it one day five times, and that's enough to drive anybody bonkers. Uh, Fleetwood away. They won, of course, 1-0 at the county ground in one of the two games that allowed crowd in uh, before Christmas. What's your thought, Ivo? Uh, it's a must-win straight away, isn't it? They were all must-win. Um, and it's... Uh... Yes, I mean, you know, as a couple of weeks ago, we were putting in some good performances against some of the better sides in the division. So, you know, maybe we'll get the sort of the John Sheridan hasn't left bounce. You know, the the the, 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 the his, his show of loyalty this week will inspire his players, and you know, Taylor Curran will start and should start actually. I think, you know, the man's on a run of form. Um, he should start up front with Tom Broadbent. Um, we should get in some more emergency loans to pad out the team. Scott Twine should be nowhere near it. Just, <laughs> you know, do, do whatever you want. Uh, yeah. I, it's, um, I, I, maybe we'll get a draw at Fleetwood. That's probably what will happen. We'll get a draw and then I'll think, oh, maybe, you know. Yeah, it's the hope that kills, isn't it? Actually, the one thing about the five substitutions on Saturday was uh, Tyler Smith playing alongside Brett Pittman. Big man, small man up front. Who knew? <laughs> What happened there? Uh, Anna, Fleetwood away. What do you reckon? Yeah, well, one, one thing is, as, as Ira said, what team's going to play? Who, who's going to turn out on the pitch? You really do not know. Who, I think after after the substitutions on Saturday, is it going to be Broadbent and Conroy in defence? Probably not. Uh, with a veiled, veiled kind of threat of uh, execution for maybe Anthony Grant that he, he made a reference, didn't he? I should have played Jack Payne. Was that a reference to Anthony Grant? And his performance was it a reference to Twine's performance? Who knows? So we don't know what team's going to turn out. Um, we're bottom of the form table for away, as away as uh, as Rob said. I honestly don't hold out a lot of hope, but I'm going to tune into I follow and give those commentators some views. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm going to get out of it. I think. 
Yeah, uh, the, the great stand, the, the the unused stand behind the stand, Rob, is always one of football's great views, isn't it? And the chippy next door to the football ground is always one of the great chippies. Uh, what's your view of Fleetwood? 4-0 Swindon, Sean. Um, Vic. 4-0 Swindon. We're going to absolutely Oof. go up to Fleetwood and murder them. It's sorry, don't mention that things. name. Rob, don't it's mention be... that name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. Yes. It's gonna be, but that's the way, that's, it, that's just the sort of thing we'll see, isn't it? That's just the sort of thing we'll see. Just when you Swindon are at their, yeah. just when Swindon are at the lowest ebb, we're all here thinking it's all going wrong. They go and put a performance in that nobody expects, like Nicky and Jose did a few years ago. Do you remember when they won one 0 at Fleetwood and we all thought, oh, they're yeah. stay? Oh, well, no, they're not. Absolutely, and I, I just, yeah. I, I mean, I, you, nothing points towards Swindon get any points this weekend. Nothing at all. Four 0 Swindon. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Anthony says, Ivo's got a better game plan than Sheridan. Uh, Liam says, love Ivo's irony. Uh, second guess, Sheridan. Good luck. He doesn't even know himself. So there we are. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not one who goes in for abuse. And I, I, as, if you, as you said, Ivo, before, he's been through terrible uh, personal circumstances. And I don't know. It seems to me that maybe somebody at the club should have just said, do you want to step aside for two or three weeks? Just sort yourself out and... You know, to me, that would have been uh, the way of it. <laughs> Love Rob's irony, too. <laughs> I don't know what he's <laughs> uh, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much indeed. We've come to the end of our time. Uh, wonderful to have you along, Ivo. I hope you'll come back and be part of another panel, will you, at some point? That'd be lovely. Yeah. Maybe on when relegation is confirmed. Let's, uh, let's yeah. have a party. We can <laughs> have a party and celebrate. What I don't know, but yes, thank no, you. I mean, I don't want to be either. bleak about it. I mean, yeah, it's so sad. My best friend lives in Harrogate, so that's I'm genuinely looking forward to that. You said that what would be the only way the season could get worse would be if Harrogate fluked a promotion through the playoffs, and then I didn't even get to go and go and see my friend in Harrogate. So that's it for me. But thank you for having yeah. me. <laughs> no, pleasure. And, and it's uh, from a local point of view, Talk United might be the they're going to blow the National League by the look of it. So that'll be another local game out of the way for me. Uh, and <laughs> That'd be great. Exeter, well, may go up or may not go up. Anna, thank you very much as always. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Okay. And Rob, thank you very much. And we'll uh, no doubt speak again soon. Thank you. Speak soon. Okay, thanks so much, guys. That was brilliant. Um, that hour went so quickly. So uh, we haven't got a on the sofa or a Monday night panel next week. Uh, not that we know of at the moment, but keep your eyes peeled. We may be able to uh, put something on for you. So thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. <laughs>